Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerili Marimò della New York University. We are delighted to have you all here tonight for the first uh, event in the Adventures in Italian Opera series with Fred Plotkin. It's the longer lasting series that we have had here at Casa Italiana. I would say the most successful and also given the turnout for tonight's event. And we are delighted that we have overcome la crisi del settimo anno, the seventh year crisis that we did not have with Fred and that he's here for the uh, eighth edition. Um, as always, I try to tell you something new about Fred every time. And uh, there are a few things, but one that is really eating my liver right now is that in a week he's going to Italy with the New York Times for an opera tour that will include Parma, and beat me up more if you can, uh, Milan, La Scala, Monferrato for some sort of uh, gastronomical intermezzo in between all these opera marvel. So that's one of the many things that uh, Fred is doing. Um, before I uh, continue with the introduction that is going to be very short, I would like to ask you to give a present to your friends who are not here tonight. So if you have any of these little devices, things in your pockets, log on to the NYU uh, network and let them know that Mariana Pizzolato and Fred Plotkin are having a conversation here on the stage of Casa Italiana right now. And your friends, wherever they are in the world, they can be able to log on our website, uh, casaitalianaNYU.org, and follow the conversation live. And they will even be able to ask questions to Mariana through, friend, uh, through Fred in the last few minutes of the conversation. So please do that if you want, but turn off the sound in your devices, because we don't want that to go on during the conversation. Um, so once again, Fred will uh, be on the stage shortly, and he will also tell you about the other guests that are coming and that are going to enrich our uh, season here at Casa Italiana. Um, and without further ado, I would like to ask you to please welcome Fred Plotkin and Mariana Pizzolato. Thank you. Well, buonasera. How are all of you? Good. Welcome back to another season of Adventures in Italian Opera. And I thought what I would start, well, the first thing I have to tell you is that this New York Times journey I'm doing, I arranged it that we go from Parma to Torino through Liguria so I can get some pesto. Because <laughs> I cannot be that close and not stop for pesto and Pansotti and all of those wonderful things, Tocco di Noce and all of those fantastic Ligurian foods. And then we go to Cremona, there's a new museum of the violin. And then we end at La Scala. And um, the artist we will hear that night is Diana Damrau singing the Countess in The Marriage of Figaro. And I mentioned her because she will be one of the guests this season at the Casa Italiana for Adventures in Italian <coughs> Opera. So first we have Mariana Pizzolato, about whom I will tell you more in a moment. Then I decided for this season that we're going to explore different aspects of opera than we've always done in the past. So we have Francesca Zambello on November 9th. Francesca Zambello is one of the top stage directors, producers. She's a native New Yorker, Italian-American. And she heads the Washington National Opera the Glimmer Glass Festival. She's a very distinguished and very, I would say, opinionated in the best sense of the word, director, producer, designer. She's a very persuasive thinker. She and I did something together at the Kennedy Center in Washington last March, and that's when I asked her to come. On December 8th, we have Corey Ellison. Corey Ellison is a dramaturg. I don't know if you know what that means, but that's someone who um, has expertise in every aspect, not only of an opera, but what the composers, the librettists, and so on intended in creating a role. Those of you who are familiar with Ma and Pa Kettle 
Corey and I are known as the Mon Pa Kettle of Opera, so I'll be glad to have her. Diana Damra, the great soprano, joins us. You may have seen February 15th. The date is February 23rd. Please note that. And she will be singing Ini Puritani next season, this season, as well as Romeo et Juliette, conducted by John Andrea Nozato, who many of you know. March 14th, we have Nadine Sierra, the wonderful young American soprano, who is um, really having a breakout career in the past couple of years. She's still very young and was the youngest ever winner of the Metropolitan Opera National Council auditions. And she did something very rare recently at La Scala. She stopped the show during Rigoletto, not because she stopped it, the audience stopped it and demanded an encore at her debut as Jilda in Rigoletto. So I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. Um, then we have, and by the way, she will be in Don Giovanni this fall at the Met in November and in Idomeneo in the spring, conducted by James Levine, about whom we will talk a bit tonight. April 11th, Daniele Rustioni. Do you know the name? Not yet, but you will. Daniele Rustioni is making his Met debut. He's a very fine Italian conductor. And as you know, I try every year to have you meet a couple of people you don't know. This is a very rich and diverse season in terms of exploring Italian opera. And then on May 3rd, uh, the guest, I'm still negotiating with the guest, but I hope that that will come to pass. But keep May 3rd in your calendar because it will be a very special night. So let us begin. I'm very pleased to welcome Mariana Pizzolato, who had a smashing Met debut October 4th, I think, as Isabella in L'Italiana in Algeri, which I have to say to you right now is one of my favorite operas. Oh. Not just my favorite Rossini operas, it's one of my favorite operas, period. And I've been waiting to talk to someone about this opera because I really, really love it for reasons you'll discover. Um, she has a long, for a very young woman, a long and distinguished pedigree singing Rossini, young, singing Rossini, singing um, some Donizetti, some Baroque music, uh, largely, mostly Italian music, and she brings what I call Italianita to her performances. It's something you either have or you don't have. Italianess would be the loose English translation, but Italianita is something beyond that. And given that she's playing a character who's called the Italian girl, you want someone with lots of Italianita. So please welcome Mariana Pizzolato. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I was recently in Sicily. Oh. Where you are from. Yeah. And you are from a place called Chiusa Sclafani. Si. <laughs> which is near Corleone. Exactly. So how did you encounter music there? Um... Buonasera. Um, first, my English is really bad, <laughs> but I will try. So I born in a in a, a little village um, called Palazzo Adriano. Just to remind you, uh, the Nuovo Cinema Paradiso, mm -hmm. just there. And I lived in Chiusa Sclafani, actually another little uh, place in the world because this exists <laughs> and um, well my meeting with the music was when I was 12 I played saxophone in a band in Cusa Sclafani <laughs> <laughs> and tenor sax actually <laughs> <laughs> not alto sax? <laughs> no 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 tenor <laughs> so um, well, I start to uh, sing in in the church in the Cappella Musicale di Monreale uh, with uh, the, the uh, with Don Giuseppe Liberto. Uh, that she is the the it, it was actually uh, until last last year the the choir conductor of pa Cappella Sistina in Rome. 
so and he's from Cusas Clafani too. So uh-huh. it was, uh, you know, a lucky meeting. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started there to, to sing for um, Claudia Carbi, who was my teacher. Uh, nothing, I started to sing at the church, uh, to be soloist. And when I finished my study at school, uh, people encouraged me uh, to uh, approach of, you know, serious Latin music. I was talking, thinking a lot of, uh, thought a lot of about this because, you know, uh, in, in Sicily, a little village, uh, family around you, no money. So you have, I was working at the Comune di Chiusa Sclafani and was a little bit difficult, you know, uh, to uh, ch- choose choice. Mm, yeah, choose, choose uh, the way to do music. But finally, music chose me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I take my study. Uh, I studied at the Conservatorio in Palermo, and then when I finished the Conservatorium, 15 days later, I had my first engagement as a wow. singer, as a singer, in Piacenza with Tancredi at the Comunale di, di Piacenza. As and Tancredi? Yes. Wow. So from Siracusa. So wow. Yes, it's true. <laughs> So I'm just going to interrupt. Julian, set up number five, please. Tancredi. Tancredi, yeah. yes. Um, and what was that like immediately going into a big role, which Tancredi is a big role, um, very serious, very dramatic, very musically complex, coming from Cusa Sclafani to Piacenza, cold, very. different food, didn't know anyone probably in the theater. Yeah. What happened? Well, what happens? I will try to to tell you a story because just for the Tancredi role, we was 40. And it was the first time in my life, my life to be on stage with uh, uh, many people on the look at me and listen to me. And I told to myself, okay, Marianna, let's do it. <laughs> Some people suggest to me before that, um, uh, dice, presentati, uh, present, present yourself. yourself for a small role. Mm-hmm. But you know, uh, I'd always been a little bit <laughs> testarda. <laughs> Stubborn. It was a little, another little uh, ro- mezzo role in this in this opera, but you know I, I had a look at the score and thought to myself, Marianna, you can do it actually, <laughs> whatever. It's your first time, just try. So I was there actually, was thirty, and I was the not the last one, just one before the last. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was seven thirty in the night. And they told me, oh my God, you will sing another time, Di Tanti Palpiti. And I said, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. I sang the Tanti Palpiti. I was away from the theater. I told to my, uh, my friend, look, let's go, let's go, let's go. I made it. It's okay. It's okay. They, will, they will never call me. Come on. They will never call me. Half hour later, they called me. Where are you, Ma- Marianna? Um, I'm in the hotel. Come, come, come. The commission wants to talk with you. So f- uh, I thought, okay, they will offer me the, the, the small mezzo part and I will upset, accept. And they offer me the Tancredi role. I was shocked, actually. I was shocked. And I had no money to study, uh, to stay in Piacenza. That's the funny part because, okay, I won the audition. I was first. I won over 40 people, <laughs> um, but no money, no money. I come back to Sicily, and fortunately, uh, people from Palermo helped me with money. Good. I mm, I sang a concert in Palermo, and uh, I uh, I had raised the money. Yeah, was the money. Yeah to be for two months in Piacenza mm-hmm. and make my debut. So, 
So although I actually <laughs> Although I actually plan to start out with L'Italiana in Algeri, I happen to have a recording of Mariana singing Di Tanti Palpiti, so Julia, number five, please. <laughs> So what I'm about to say might sound strange, but I know you'll understand the way I mean it. Um, I think in all of opera, that is the most perfect aria of all. It doesn't mean it's the best aria. It doesn't mean it's harder to sing or easier to sing. But I just think that that, if I were introducing opera to someone who knew nothing about opera, and I do this every day of my life, um, this is the aria I would pick. And the reason is, it's all about the voice, it's all about breath, it's all about expressivity. It's a, as a technician, it's about knowing the notes. But as an artist, it's about expressing the music and the notes and where the breath comes. Mariana or anyone else singing this can decide where to breathe, but each aspect of those choices become your expression. So that anyone I've ever heard sing this, and I've heard many women sing it, and even a few men try it, mm -hmm. um, because it's just so perfect. And Rossini, I've said it many times, I'll say it again, is the most underrated opera composer of all. And he could create music for the voice that no one else could ever yeah. before or after. Um, Wagner, Verdi, a whole bunch of the Mozart created great music, but nothing for the voice that matches Rossini. 
And I think that Rossini is one of the hardest composers to sing really well. So, this being your first opera performance, yeah. and you get to sing arguably the greatest aria in all of opera, and it's short, it's three minutes. What did it feel like inside of you? I don't mean the public and their response, but that music inside of you, what was the sensation? Well, actually, uh, what I have to, to tell you is uh, the Tanti Palpiti, as you say, it's a simple music if you want. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's, if you want, it's simple, nothing, in nothing complicated, nothing, nothing difficult. Extreme. But that means more uh, emotion because mm -hmm. you have to tell something with a very simple music. It's more responsibility because you have to because you have to uh, uh, express something really uh, low, so. And the big introduction is this uh, in this aria. It means that you come from far, from very far, mm -hmm. and you have to think think about the the trip to arrive in Syracuse on stage. I mean. So it's not just coloratura or line. It's just something more deep, deep. It's very emotional. Yeah, absolutely. Tom Crady is expecting to arrive in Syracuse, where I was lucky to be last week. Syracuse <laughs> <Good for> you. <laughs> being one of my very favorite cities in Italy. And I went to Noto, which is this Baroque city nearby with fantastic ice cream, gelato. Yeah. Uh, really some of the best gelato anywhere. And so I sampled all Thank the you for what I could. And, but then I went back to Syracuse, and Syracuse was founded in 734 BC and is the greatest city of the ancient Greek Empire, even though it was not in Greece, it was in Sicily. And the level of culture, the level of sophistication, the fact that you can turn a corner and see papyrus growing and realize this is where paper arrived in Europe, that um, Archimedes was born there, and Archimedes was the person who was not only a mathematician, but a definer not only of circles, but spheres. And the reason this is so very important, he was the first person who made us understand that when we look at something, it's not flat, it has depth and texture. And a sphere means there's a part of it that we do not see that there are things behind, that there are things that are hidden. And this, to me, is the foundation of, of the Italian approach to creativity in the world. And it came from Syracuse, and it came from Archimedes, mm -hmm. and it remains part of Italian thinking today. So when you walk there and people acknowledge that he was there, that so much of the initial creative impulse in all of Italy came from the town of Syracuse. It's very moving. So what we hear in Rossini's aria, in the music that leads up to arriving in Syracuse, that Rossini understood so well, and I get goosebumps talking about it, is that Syracuse is not a normal, regular, nice little town. It is one of the pillars of civilization. Mm -hmm. And you being Sicilian, yeah. understand that. So you as a Sicilian singing this character, yeah. what else came to you as part of the development of the role? Uh, you know, uh, we, we Sicilian people, we Sicilian people, we grow up with, um, with this um, mixture of cultures uh, around us. So we really grow up, as, as you know, Roberto, we grew up with these feelings to be, uh, to be Greece, to be Arab, to be Spanish, to be France, to be Norman. We are everything. Maybe be Sicilian. <laughs> it means really this. So when you sing, um, when you sing Tancredi, you have to think about the, of this stuff, mm -hmm. and actually you have to think that you sing a man role you are a man in this moment. So you have to change your mind because it's not feminine, you know, style is just be a man, 
a warrior, be in Syracuse and fight for your love and fight for your patria. So it means a lot for Sicilian people mm -hmm. that. So Julian, set up number one, please. I'm now switching over to Italiana in Algeri. Why is it one of my favorite operas? Um, number one, I love Rossini, but number two, I believe that Rossini was ahead of his time in everything, and very few people, apart from Giuseppe Verdi, acknowledge that. Verdi knew that Rossini was the pillar on which Verdi could stand. And you go to, for example, Guillaume Tell, William Tell, and you find music that inspired Verdi in Il Trovatore. You go to Italiana in Algeri, which is ostensibly a comedy, and you find music and you find ideas that inspired Verdi some 30 years later, 25 years later, to write music to ask Italians to think of themselves as Italians, to form a nation. Nabucco and all the operas that we well know that Verdi wrote in the 1840s and 50s, Rossini wrote in 1813. And so I'll tell you a little bit about Italiana. It was performed in Venice for the first time on May 22nd, 1813. Anybody know what else happened on that day for extra credit? <laughs> Richard Wagner was born on that day in Leipzig, <laughs> Germany. And Richard Wagner would come to know Rossini. And although he made bad jokes about Rossini, Rossini was smart enough to be the only strong advocate for Wagner in Paris when everybody else turned their backs on Wagner. So Rossini was a bigger man for that. Um, <coughs> being 1813, it was a period of war. And Venice was uh, contested by Napoleon, by the Austrian Empire. Uh, it was not part of Italy because there was not a Republic of Italy. And therefore, writing a comedy in a period of war was something very unusual that we don't think about nowadays. If we write comedies about war the way maybe Bertolt Brecht would have done, it has a heaviness. But Rossini, through his music and through his infusion of Italian character into his music, made people feel proud to be Italian, whatever Italian meant at that time, because they were Venetians and Milanese and Florentines and Umbrians and Calabresi and Sicilians and so on. It was not a nation, but they were, let's call it Italo, as a people. They were Italian-influenced. And so he created this character, or the libretto had the character, the libretto by Angelo Anelli, which in fact had already been in opera, uh, L'Italiano in Algeri, by Luigi Mosca, written in 1808. Anyone ever seen that one? Yeah. Um, there's a good reason for that. But the libretto was good. And when Rossini came along and wrote it in 1813, he understood that part of this, although it's a comedy, was to inspire pride in being Italian. And no one had really ever defined being Italian before. They defined being Florentine or Venetian or whatever. But here Rossini came along during wartime and said, we will create a character, a woman, even more important, not a man, who will be a hero, who will be an Italian, proudly an Italian. So the story of Isabella is that she's on a ship that is shipwrecked near Algiers. And she washes ashore and dusts herself off and sings cruda sorte, bad luck. But it becomes a resolve about how she will make the best of a bad situation because I'm Italian, we are resourceful, this is what we do. So Julian, please play Mariana uh, singing Cruda Sorte. And I want to thank the Metropolitan Opera, which gave us all the selections tonight from Italiana from, really? your, from your debut. Wow. And so this was the first time <laughs> she sang it on me. the Met stage. <laughs> and uh, I do thank the Met for that. And so Cruda Sorte, Italiana in Algeria, October 4th, 2016. Io conosco. Ruda sorte, amor ti hanno, questo il primo di mia fe.
è tempo del sole Or chi sono si vedrà Or chi sono si vedrà Già so per pratica qual sia l'effetto Tu sguardo languido, tu un sospiro She <laughs> sold on Cora. Uh, wow. <laughs> Julian, please set up number two. Um, this is about teaching you and also you watching at home about Rossini because we have an expert here and we have an admirer of experts. <laughs> and um, he, in this music, you can hear how an Italian woman washed up alone in North Africa, where someone looks at her and says, you would be good in a harem. This is what we've been looking for. I'm not kidding, that's what the words say. Because the ruler there has been saying, I don't want my wife, I want an Italian girl. I want to see what that's all about. And she shows up, washed ashore, and says, all right, this okay. is not good, but I'll make it work. And you can hear in the music how she comes to her resolve in the second part of the aria, right? Where it, if all the music changes. Mm -hmm. So when you're singing the character and you're also using the music to express the story, tell me what you do. Oh. Um, well, in the first part, in the first part when, when Isabella arrived in Algeria, uh, came with the slaves, touched, touch her, everything. So I came really angry. In the first part of the aria, she's really angry mm -hmm. with everybody, and with Lindoro maybe, and with uh, with the stupid Tadeo on stage, and um, well, and she's really, really fight with herself. What I'm doing here in Algeria, and the second part when. She realized, I think, that the poor slaves are a little bit stupid. And, and eunuchs. Exactly. They, oh. They're missing something, so they're eunuchs. I'm not kidding. Yeah. <laughs> and Isabella think, OK, no. No, no, no paura. No paura. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I will manage everything. Give me just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so from this moment, she play really powerful. Mm -hmm. So in the, oh, I want to ask you a question first. The 
titles, the projected titles, when your character is asked where she's from, it says Livorno. Yeah. Did I hear you say Palermo last night? <laughs> yeah, yesterday. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> I looked and it said Livorno, and I knew the character was Livorno, but she said Palermo. Of course. <laughs> Because, <laughs> because Nicola Laimo and me, actually, we are from Palermo, both. So why Livorno is much better Palermo, do you? <laughs> so <laughs> Di Palermo and Bedue ci si intende e me ne vanto. <laughs> Which also means two things. Number one, Mariana's diction is superb. And number two, as I've written endless times, the acoustics at the Metropolitan Opera House are fantastic. Yeah. They're really fantastic. So if, did you find that it's a big theater, but singers tell me it's very intimate, that the return of sound is good? Yeah. So, well, to be on stage for the first time at the Metropolitan Opera with a bigger role, and it's a little bit just difficult. But, you know. Um, the the feeling that I had the first time that you when you look you see this huge theater the big theater maybe in the world four thousand exactly and you tell okay my voice it's supposed to arrive at the last row ro yeah. mm -hmm. okay and you think what I can do it but finally you have to do it nothing just to sing um f free and happy <laughs> and people will understand everything true and the sensation that the feeling on stage with all the colleagues is huge because if the if the all if the auditorium is big the stage is made uh so good to uh you can feel uh you can feel uh, the the sound around you clearly so you can project the sound in the, in the auditorium easily mm -hmm. so the feeling is perfect finally the and yes and so with james levine actually was something special i mean i'm i think with him it's easier you are a lucky artist to be able yeah. to say that you worked with James Levine. Yeah, I am. I do. Um, this production I saw on its opening night, I believe it was 1982, starring Marilyn Horn. Mm -hmm. And the production was by Jean-Pierre Ponel. And that name may not be familiar to all of you now, but he was in the handful of the greatest stage directors and producers in the world. Absolutely. He was a man of culture. He understood what composers and librettists wanted rather than doing a gimmick. So he didn't set this on a sinking ship in the Mediterranean now, unfortunately, with all the drama of refugees and so on. <laughs> I've seen productions like that of Italian and Algeri. It's just completely wrong. He understood the delicate cultural issues of Christianity and Islam and an independent woman versus a man who was crazy about her, but he also was an authoritarian head of state and uh, who likes to take a steam bath, a hammam on the stage and scrub himself in front of his people. Um, so it was, I won't say culturally accurate, but it was culturally relevant in different ways. And the scenery evokes Islamic architecture of North Africa and allows the humor and the humanity to come out on its own. And one of the most beautifully directed scenes in the whole opera comes in the second act in which Isabella, by now we know that she's the most intelligent, resourceful person on the stage, seduces three men at the same time without looking at them. How does she do that? She holds a mirror and she will turn the mirror to see one man who likes her who's Italian. She'll turn it and over her shoulder see the, uh, the bay Mustafa, who is the man who runs Algiers. And then she'll turn it that way and see Lindoro, the man she really loves, who is being held a slave and being 
threatened to send to be sent away to Italy, leaving Isabella there. And so while sitting in a chair, ostensibly just making herself up, you have this brilliant piece of direction and acting and music in uh, an aria called Per Lui Che Adoro, For He Whom I Love. And the way it's perceived by the men behind her is that she loves each one of them. She knows who she loves. And it requires not only beautiful direction, but really subtle acting. So that we know, not only the physical acting, but the vocal acting, that she's flirting with the uh, Mustafa, but not in any way that he will seriously ever get anywhere with her. She's placating Tadeo, who is sort of a strange, nerdy Italian guy. There are not many Italian nerds, but he's one of them. <laughs> and then there's the wonderful Lindoro, who she actually loves. So when you listen to this, maybe you want to say something about it before, imagine her seducing three men with a mirror while looking at you in the audience. No, what I want to say is after Pornell, tutto è stato inventato. Everything was invented after Pornell. Penso che Pornell ha capito veramente tutto di come affrontare italiani in Algeria. She thinks that Pornell understood absolutely everything about how to approach Italian in Algeria. Sei d'accordo, Fred? Sono d'accordo. Well, I've seen it. I want to talk to you about another production after, but I agree mostly. Yeah. Especially this scene. That scene you is, cannot resolve better than this. There's no better operatic direction than that scene. I mean, yes, there are great crowd scenes in opera and Aida and so on. Yeah. But in terms of directing one character plus three behind who don't speak, it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I made yeah. sorry, I made another production with Dario Fo actually That's as Dai. Oh about. okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I saw that production. Yes. But let's talk about this one yeah. now. Let's hear Mariana sing Julian uh, Per Lui Che Adoro. From where? From the Met on your opening oh night. My God.
ancora guarda guarda aspetta 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 tu non sai no no non sai no no non sai chi sono ancora guarda guarda aspetta 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 tu non sai no no non sai no no non sai chi sono ancora chi sono ancora chi sono ancora chi sono ancora furba e la furba la muove la muove Funny. Julian, please set up number three. Um, I was going to raise with you the question of Dario Fo. Um, this broadcast today is October 13th, 2016, and Dario Fo, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1997, died today at the age of 90 in Italy. And uh, I knew him. I worked with him on a production mm -hmm. in 1979 of La Storia del Soldato, L'Histoire du Soldat, at the Teatro Nazionale in Milan, and adored Dario Fo for many, many reasons. And you worked with him in L'Italiano in Algeria yeah. in 2006 in Pesaro. So doing this opera with a man who fundamentally was not an opera director, but he was a genius, and he was an Italian, talk about developing that production with his concepts and his views. Um, dirò questo in italiano. Uh, dunque, lavorare con Dario Fo è stata una delle esperienze più vibranti, più toccanti nella storia, diciamo, della mia breve, breve carriera. Traduco, that um, working with Dario Fo in l'italiana in Algeria was one of the most sensational in terms of feeling, vibrante, and touching experiences of my brief career. 
perché Dario Fo non era un attore, non era, eh, non, era, non era semplicemente un uomo di teatro, era qualcosa di più, era un uomo che veramente si era fatto da solo e tutto quello che faceva veniva proprio dal suo vissuto e, e questo va innanzitutto detto di Dario Fo. So he was not, Fo was not only an actor, not that there's anything wrong with that, but he was a, a self-made man in terms of everything of who he was as an artist was who he was as a man and what he learned through his life experience. Um, and he was a man of the theater, much more than simply being an actor. Sì, era un giullare e di fatto nel suo tipo, di, nel suo teatro viene fuori questa pazzia, se vogliamo. E, è una pazzia sempre controllata, secondo Stendhal, per me, se, per me poteva essere l'uomo adatto a, eh, ad accogliere le richieste di Stendhal, questa follia mm -hmm. diciamo riconosciuta ma sempre, mol, sempre contenuta. E quello che Dario Fo mh, diciamo, mh, ci ha insegnato durante l'italiana in Algeri è stato proprio le, la, lo sperimentare la gioia del teatro innanzitutto. That was a lot to translate, but he was a giulare. Giulare is a particular Italian word which is not a wandering minstrel, it's a wandering actor, performer, street performer who wanders around the piazzas of northern Italy, central Italy, southern Italy, adapting spontaneously to the audience that he or she finds him or herself in front of. And he was, Faux was someone who understood the spontaneity but also the joy of what Mariana referred to as a controlled craziness, uh, which is a very good term. It means that you're always willing to go over or near the edge, but not just for the sake of doing it. There has to be a reason to artistically go to that edge of, of slight craziness. If you know um, Roberto Benigni, the actor, he similarly goes there, but he was influenced as many people were by Dario Fo. What I'm gonna add now about Dario Fo was that he invented his own language, which was called Gramelot. And it's sort of a Northern Italian rural, um, I always say that he's from a valley far, far north of Bergamo, that he's just sort of up in the mountains away from the mainstream of Italian culture and society, but speaks in a very rustic way. And when Dario Fo spoke in Gramelot, there was, there was a play he wrote called Mistero Buffo. The mystery plays of the Middle Ages were narratives of the Gospels uh, telling religious stories, but in a way that appealed to people, popular piazza people and not scholars. So the stories would be told in local dialect, in this case, the Gramalot. But it was always spontaneous, so that if Dario Fo that day heard about a political event or heard that Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature, he would have had something to say about that. So he used theater as uh, political and social commentary. Mm -mm. And in the mm -mm. context mm -mm. of opera, where it's very, I don't want to say limited, but restricted because you have music that sets a beat, you have other things that require you not to be spontaneous. How did Dario Fo teach you spontaneity to use in the context of opera? Ma il concetto è molto semplice e ha usato la libertà. <ride> Paradossale, ma è così. Di fatto, um, è Praticamente questa italiana in Algeri eh, è concepita diciamo, geograficamente classico, ma all'interno diciamo, di questa geografia gli elementi si muovono veramente spontaneamente, tant'è vero che lui ha introdotto all'interno dell'opera l'uso di giocolieri, eh, di ehm, come si dice, trampoli, eh, gente che gioca, va in bicicletta, perché tutto avviene quasi in una, come se fosse in una piazza, mm -hmm. come se fosse in un circo. Ed è questa 
la novità, le trovate sceniche di Dario Fo eh, sono eh, geniali per questo, perché tutto è, perché sem è sempre una grande festa, è la festa dell'italiana in Algeri e questo, questa, questa produzione si apre con un bellissimo eh, quadro di, di, di italiani e musulmani insieme, è un ricordo bellissimo e questo è Dario Fo, la gioia, la libertà di muoversi dentro uno spazio, di, di muoversi dentro una, una geografia precisa, ma con tutta l'espressione, con tutta la gioia e la spontaneità di cui lui veramente era eh, mh, testimone. Ecco. So, I'll translate all that. Um, the paradox was that you found spontaneity and you found freedom in the strictures and the structures of opera. So that for Dario Fo, he followed the story, but he introduced theater elements exactly. that were more of the Italian piazza, which did not mean that, although it was set in Algiers, that it couldn't have the spirit of the opera, because what this production had that I saw with a different artist um, was remarkable spontaneity. And, and the woman who played it, Daniela Barcellona, who played it, um, played it as Dario Fo wanted it because he gave her the freedom to be Daniela Barcellona's Italian girl and you were Mariana Pizzolato's Italian girl, but they were in this setting that you could call it circus, but that's not quite accurate because circus would suggest lions and tricks and clowns and so on. That's more Fellini. But what Dario Fo created was a world, yeah. an environment, a spirit of Italianness, in which Italianità that I spoke of at the beginning, in which all of this could be introduced in a setting in which the artists, primarily Isabella, were allowed mm -hmm. to express mm -hmm. what they felt yeah. as a character, as what the music inspired them to do. What I so loved about that production Yes, Ponell was a scholar and a genius and gave freedom to the artist to do what he understood. But what Dario Fo did, which was incredibly rare, was to give the artist the freedom to be themselves rather than be what Dario Fo told them to do. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's so rare. Uh, I will say that I once saw another Dario Fo production of a Rossini opera in Finland. And I adore the Finns. I really do. It's a wonderful place. They didn't get it. They didn't understand that Italian libertà. The Finns are a very different kind of society. They're a much more cohesive society and, and much more, uh, they pull together, so to speak. It's too far from Italy. And it's too far. But actually, if you go, our friend John Andre Nozeda went there recently and he conducted in Finland. He said it was fantastic. They're yeah. great audiences. But Um, the Finnish artist did not understand Dario Fo's conception that you completely understood and, and your cast understood. You cannot enjoy to work with Dario Fo. Yeah. You cannot. Yeah. You have to. <laughs> you have to. You say costretto a esprimere la gioia. You <laughs> are forced to express <laughs> yeah. joy when you work with Dario Fo. And it's a f amazing, yeah. amazing, amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Dario. Well, I'm glad that we were able to pay tribute to him today. Um, I would like to now have another aria from the Met, from your premiere of L'Italiano in Algeri, the big <laughs> showstopper at the end. It's not a traditional showstopper with lots of Rossinian flourishes. It is, and this is what I was talking about at the beginning, It is the most explicit declaration of what it means to be an Italian that had been written to that point. And Verdi, who I adore, didn't write too much about Italians. He wrote about magnificent characters, but not all of them are Italian. Some are. But um, this performance, Pensa alla Patria, Think of Your Homeland, Think of what it means to be an Italian. As we attempt now to set ourselves free, remember those Verdian type words, from our captors here in Algiers, and we will be smart, we will be resourceful, 
we will arrange things so that we can get out and flourish and get home to Italy. As you do this, find the courage to think of your homeland, Pensa la Patria, even though there was no homeland. There was Livorno or Palermo. <laughs> Whatever. But there was not in Italy. So this was a big declaration to the mm. Italians. Vero? Si, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the is the it's, it's a stop in the opera, you know, because uh, it's the serious moment in mm -hmm. the opera. At last, Isabella is not angry. She's not angry, but she's serious. Angry. Angry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Angry. Too. Um, <laughs> very serious with Taddeo playing a lot, a, lot, a little bit stupido, mm -hmm. and with. Lindoro. Lindoro. She wants to tell him, hey, I'm here for a, a precise reason. I'm not here for joking. The joking now, okay, finish. But now you have to think of la patria, honor, love. So you have to fight for them. Mm -hmm. And look. The l'Italia, vedi il valore dell'Italia, il popolo italiano, e la, ri la ricerca dell'onore, la lotta per l'onore e per la patria. È veramente un momento, eh, eh, un momento speciale nell'opera, in una commedia come l'Italiana in Algeri, un momento molto serio. It's a very serious moment, a very comic opera. Yeah. And unexpected. Yeah. It's an unexpected Absolutely. turn. It was for the audience in the Teatro San Jose in Venice in 1813 during a European wide war. So, yes, they went for a comedy, but what they got at the end was Rossini, young Rossini. He was 13 and 8, he was 21. Is that possible? Yes. He was 21. He was a genius. Wow. What were you doing at 21? <laughs> and he was writing a declaration of Italian liberation. So let's hear Mariana from October 4th, 2016. Thanks again to the Metropolitan Opera in Pensa alla Patria.
tacere fra pochi istanti fra pochi istanti rivedremo le pote arene e benedio del mio bene del mio bene coraggiosa amor mi fa Please set up number four. Um, I love this production by Ponell. The only thing that I don't love in, in it is that during this aria, they unfurl a banner that <laughs> says, Viva l'Unità d'Italia. Viva l'Italia Unita. Viva l'Italia Unita, <laughs> um, which I believe in, but um, it didn't come for another 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, they were pushing the Risorgimento onto yeah. uh, a completely different time frame. Um, a question I want to ask you about, I love the opera, as you know, I love this production. I've seen it since the very beginning. It starred Marilyn Horn. Marilyn is a very dear friend of mine. I've been fortunate to work with her and collaborate and know her, and I adore her. Like you. What? Because I want to know her. Oh, okay. I'm looking forward. I can do that. Okay. Um, Thank you. But <laughs> Marilyn Horn, brilliant singer, very distinctive personality on the stage, very sunny, can be, very radiant, very uh, charismatic, played the role with more humorous elements. You play the role, although you have a wonderful sense of humor, entirely seriously. Every moment, every act, every gesture, Isabella is serious. We may find things funny, but to your Isabella, everything is very, very serious. And the feeling, I loved it, it was very different. And there was a moment that Marilyn did that maybe she did or maybe Ponell put in that you didn't do. I don't know if you know the moment. Um, 
when they do the ceremony to create the papatachi, the secret order, uh, where you don't see, you don't hear, you know, the three monkeys, um, they bring out spaghetti, and the Mustafa is very confused by how you eat spaghetti and twirl it and so on. What the Isabella of Marilyn Horn did was she pulled out a strand of spaghetti, tasted it, and looked at the audience and says, al dente. <laughs> Was that raised in your direction, or you? Yes. It was, so OK. So I, I made it in the, the, the first mm -hmm. performance, okay. uh, the opening night. Mm -hmm. But some people suggest not do it anymore, because in another production of Zauberflote, there is the same uh, battuta. Same so it's better to, uh, yeah. But where, why eat spaghetti in Zauberflot, in the magic food? I have food? no idea. Bird seed, maybe, but not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in Italian in Algeria, spaghetti is so iconically Italian. Yeah, of course. And I mean, to me, it was an important point because the character is saying that it meets her very high standards as an Italian. Yeah, I think so, and too. And that's why. I would put it back in. I'm not your director on this production, but um, the suggestion yeah. uh, it came from from the the theater. You know, okay. it's not uh, it's not okay. my you know my our responsibility. Right. I know. understand. Okay, so um, you had a big success on opening night, and I have a little bit of video. Julian, please play selection number four. So now we're going to talk about a different opera. Tu mi vuoi fare piangere? Non è giusto. Non devi piangere. Se vuoi piangere, puoi piangere. Um, so Mariana just said, why do you want to make me cry? Um, the next performance maybe will make you cry in a different way. Julian, set up number six, please. Um, I suppose that everyone says that the greatest comic opera ever written is Il Barbiere di Siviglia. But I don't agree with that. It's a great comic opera. But I'm not saying that La Cenerentola is the greatest comic opera either. It's not. But what Rossini understood, and that we don't give him credit for, is that a lot of times the most human comedy is where you have a tear in one eye. And where a com what the French call comédie larmaillante in which you have a little bit of crying, because what you're crying about is the recognition that you're human. And so that the opera La Cenerentola about Cinderella, um, sort of in this opera, the humor such as it is, is in the stepsisters, it's in other characters. But Angelina, the name of the character, is a very serious person. She loves a prince. He notices her. There are no slippers in this opera. It's a, it's a bracelet or something. Yeah. I forget. Yeah, and um, but she's a slave in a household with terrible people, and she's badly treated and and cooking and and you know living in dirt. Cenerentola means the girl in the ashes, so to speak, and it's a very serious thing. Uh, the name in German <coughs> is even better. It's a German story. Aschenputtel. <laughs> I'm not kidding, Aschenputtel. Your character, would you do this in Germany, auf Deutsch, it's Aschenputtel. Um, I love saying the word. Um, my father's favorite word in German was from a, a Schubert song, Schlittenfart. <laughs> um, 
sleigh ride. Schlitten fart. And anyway, he, he would say it ten times in a row. But I prefer, I prefer Aschenputtel myself. But anyway, here is your Aschenputtel. Um, the final scene in which she lived in misery, not Guelafano, I lived in misery, but she suddenly realizes that she's happy. And I think part of what happens, and you make this work so well, which is why I'm playing your performance of it, is that she understands the misery of where she came from. She came from nothing, from complete disadvantage. And through good luck, through sticking to her own values, through being honest, through being caring when other people were not, she managed to be very lucky and have what seems like a happy ending unlike Rosina the Barber of Seville, who does not, which is why I feel sorry for Rosina, but not for Aschenputtel. Um, so when you develop this character, we all know the story of Cinderella, but this Rossini Cinderella is very different. So we cannot play her and we cannot direct her as Cinderella. You created a character. Tell me how you created the character. Well, there's a lot of stories about Cenerentola. As my coach and friend, uh, Mark Markham, know. Um, so I was in a point in my life that I wanted to sing No More Cenerentola for me. Uh, because actually, I didn't understand that Cenerentola wanted to meet me. So, finally, I discovered that to, to sing Cenerentola, I have to sing my story, <laughs> my life, actually. <laughs> and uh, I feel like a Cenerentola sometimes. And when, um, and when I'm, I was singing a Cenerentola in Parigi, in Paris, four years ago, do you remember, Mark? Uh, I was discovered again a new way to sing this role because it's not just a favola. Fable. No, it's not. I was asking to myself, Marianna, what you, ha you have to do to sing this role? It's not just, you know, uh, a Walt Disney story. It's more. It's your life. You have to sing that and meet Angelina. So I discovered finally, Fred, that Angelina came on stage with me mm -hmm. to protect me, protect me, and sing with me. How oh, the best way to sing Cenerentola is 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 a huge role. It's the the most uh, the most. Uh, importante ma generoso human being in the story of the opera, I think. Mm -hmm. It's not just a fable, it's not Walt Disney. It's another thing, it's another stuff. It's more deeply story. Except in this libretto that we don't have Zucca and Carro... Yeah, the carriages no, and so no, on, yeah. no, no, no. It's just a real story. And I feel it really, I feel lucky because I'm, I have, I had this, oppor this big opportunity to sing Cenerentola. It's one of my favorite role. For a mezzo-soprano, I think one of the best in the world. And I'll be honest, that's why I picked it. <laughs> because I think you can really feel in Mariana's performance that she's not playing a fable that it's as if she was enacting her own something from very deep in her yeah. own life. She'll never be Brunhilde, but who wants to be Brunhilde when you could be La Cenerentola? So, <laughs> <laughs> so Julian, if you please, selection number six. One day, maybe. Okay. <laughs> what is this with production? Oh. <laughs>
you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Thank I'm just going to briefly say about that, that more than any performance I've ever seen of that aria, she sang and acted what it was about. That she was genuinely overwhelmed by her good fortune. <laughs> and But remembered and acknowledged her misery mm. at the beginning. And the good fortune only works if you acknowledge the misery. And most people who sing this, even really wonderful artists, do it musically. And they're terrific. They do everything you want musically and more. But they don't communicate what character is saying as effectively as Mariana did. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. We have we have time just for a couple of questions and I'm going to ask that they be brief and to the point. And bear in mind that I will repeat the question so that viewers at home can hear the question and then Mariana will answer it. Yes. As a uh, as a singer at the beginning of career is so impressive, right? Amazing. And I was wondering if you had any secrets of what you do. Do you uh, exercise? Has it evolved as well in your own singing? Repeto la domanda. The question was, as a singer at the beginning of your career still, your fioratura is so beautiful and de well-developed and produced. <laughs> and do you have any secrets about how to do I that? Do Actually, you are, you're born with this kind of uh, conformation, vocal cord or elasticity, elasticity uh, to sing so fast, you know. But of course, the nature need to be helped to go out. So what uh, personally I uh, do for coloratura is think. Uh, that seeing that uh, these little notes are always ahead of me, not inside. So you have to follow something. It's outside of you. Join the sound of my coach. They tell me sometimes. <laughs> Join the sound. The sound is not uh, inside of you, but it's outside. It's like join something. And you want to acquire <laughs> the grasp. Yeah. yeah. So another question. Of right course, here. you have to breathe a lot. You have to breathe. You have to su yeah. breathe sorry, yeah. uh, to support. If not, you sing the coloratura with throat. Can be an effect, but it's not right. For my opinion, it's just you know what I think about it. Question here. Grazie. Grazie. Sì. Uh, con una produzione dello spagnolo One Font, ovviamente un'altra uh, completamente visione dello spettacolo. Come ti prepari a questa avventura in Medio Oriente? Let me first repeat the question. Um, you are going to be doing soon a production of Italiana in Algeria in the Middle East. Where in the Middle East? At the Royal Opera House Mosca. At the Royal Opera House in, in Mosca, Oman. In Oman a new beautiful opera house. And given the setting, the context, uh, it'll be a Spanish director named who? Uh, Juan Font. Juan Font, okay. Um, how are you preparing yourself for this role and this experience? Grazie per la domanda, Francesca, that she's the casting director. Um, well, I'm looking forward, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot imagine how an, an Italian girl go in Oman. It's not Algeria, but still, it's the same. So I'm looking forward. <laughs> it's close, actually. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious. I don't know if uh, we have to, um, come si dice, aggiustare. Adjust. Adjust something for the or Oriental people. Be yeah, <laughs> Oriental is not correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm curious. I'm curious, and I'm really, re yeah, I'm excited 
about this. Uh, of course, it's a big opportunity for me. And I know that Oriental men like curvy women. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to action. <laughs> Perhaps you will actually discover what the character Mustafa is about. You'll discover Exactly. It. Um, Sorry, Piero, don't be jealous. I wonder if a friend of mine is watching. I went with a beautiful curvy woman to Cairo a number of years ago, and she clung to my arm because everyone kept yelling to her, Habiba, Habiba, which means, hey, beauty, but curvy women. Exactly. That's what they love. So she's Habiba and you're Habiba. Thanks. So when they say it, be prepared. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Mariana would grace us with a few sentences in Sicilian. Okay. Let, let me translate first. The, the questioner said that she was pleased that I spoke so lovingly about the town of Siracusa, which I do love because your grandmother was from there. And would Mariana grace us with a few sentences in Siciliano? So... No bad words, madam. <laughs> what I can see. Sutta sta to finesha, ci si minasti shuri, e dopo cinque misi, garofani spuntaru, bedda tu sini kutsa, como sta to finesha, bedda tu sini Nikutsa Komuli Shurito Nikutsa Duchi Nikutsa Bedda Dunami Dunami Navasatedda Amuri Mi Gioia di larma, di lume cori lu fuoco karma, sogno capaci pitti a soffrire, si dumila si è meglio morire. Si du pizzi tu tu scegli a mia. Iuti marito, quando vuoi.